You can read every book under the fucking stars, but if you can't translate and apply it and understand that all leadership styles will apply at one point in time, then you're already behind the eight ball, right? Because a manager is different than a leader. And sometimes we put the wrong ones in the wrong spots. We do. You want to be a good street sergeant? You want to be a good lieutenant on patrol? Know the policy, know the law, listen to what your officer said and understand that when they're telling you something, it's from their point of view at that time. Hey guys, if you missed out on the last conference in Nashville, Tennessee, you don't want to miss out on the next one. It's April 28th through May 3rd, Orlando, Florida, the Gaylord Palms Resort and Convention Center. You made a mistake missing the last one. You don't want that to happen again on this one. Five days of some of the best training you're ever going to experience packed into one event. We have an early bird special right now, $50 off. Use 24 early bird on our website, streetcop.com. Look for the conference, click the link, register today. If you want to get significantly better at this profession in five days, don't dare miss out on the 2024 Street Cop Conference. Hey everybody, Heather from Street Cop. I teach the complete female cop and be the change. And I am here with... Ellie Alfonso, also now with Street Cop Training, and I teach legal use of force, the law enforcement professional. So excited. I feel like this has come full circle because we met probably about a year ago almost. October. It was last October. Yeah, and actually just two days ago was the first time I met Turtle and Mike. That's right. Yeah, so, and here we are, which I'm really excited about. Uh, Before we start anything, I just really want to talk about your course because I think it's incredible, and I've pushed for a really long time to get you here. And actually, before we go into that, let's just let everybody know that this is the first time that two females have run the Street Cop podcast. Yes, not a man. Let me let me preface this. Not Ellie. A white, I am not a white male. It's Ellie, not Eli. <laughs> I get it. It's the hair. It's the hair, the shoulders, maybe. I don't know. Uh, maybe. Um, yeah, you made this happen. This was No, this was you your, made this, this happen. This was your project from day one. You saw something. You said, let's do this. And I said, what are you talking about? What do you see? Yeah. The and first then, time I met you, I was like, she's, she's got to be with us. We talked about it yesterday a little bit, uh, the fear of change, right? And then you see yourself in this box because I've been doing law enforcement for 26 years now. So I know my role. Or I the thought lady. I knew my role. Yeah, right? <laughs> like holy a quarter of a century. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's accurate. Wow. Yeah. And then, so my, my program, what I think it is, is a more comprehensive view of use of force, right? I think that academies and agencies teach it in silos, like case law one day, maybe a handcuff technique, maybe, right? Maybe a little bit of neuroscience, understanding fear in the amygdala and how to train past that. And I've seen in 26 years, it's very ineffective that way. And it sets us up. It sets us up. We become newsreels. We have IAs. We have complaints. We can't justify what we did or how we did it or why we did it. So I said, you know what? I'm going to put something together for my people. And then it became something really big. Thanks to you. Thanks to Dennis. Thanks to Gracie Baja. Yeah. So my whole, and listen, Dennis did a podcast where he talked about when you have an opinion, you're open to critique, right? I have an opinion. So I don't get involved in like Instagram battles or people that want to challenge an opinion. I care enough to have an opinion. I care enough to do the research. Now decide for yourself, right? There's no absolutes in anything. I just think there's better ways in safer ways. And what do I think is the best for an officer for longevity and peace of mind? So I came up with that program. I love that. When I, when I first met you, it was at our train the trainer defensive tactics thing that we went to back in uh, last October. And you just started talking about case law. And I get, I like love case law. It's my jam. Like I get so excited about it. The nerd in me completely comes out. And I was like, wow, I have never heard anybody other than really Dennis. And I, sh- you know, I've never actually gone to one of Zach Miller's class. I, I would love to. Uh, but I've heard Dennis talk about it. <clears throat> and the way you did was so applicable to what we were trying to do with New Jersey women in law enforcement to allow women to feel comfortable, not only training jujitsu or training close defensive tactics instead of having to go to our OC or our baton or those things. And then you use this broad stroke to paint applicable case law and in a way that was so easy to understand and apply. I was like, huh, I really like how she did that. Yeah. And that's when I you came up to you right after. about that day? Who can tell me Graham versus Connor? And then you go like this. Fine. <laughs> All right, Terry, Ohio. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. There was somebody in the class with us that used to work for one of the prosecutor's office that I know. And she turned to me. She's like, I think you know case law better than some of the APs I work with. Yeah. And I was like, well, that it's my job on this level to do that. And I just... You know, we we also were talking the other day about how 
it's just changed so much with this generation that's come in because of all the George Floyds and and, and the incidents of use of force that get portrayed in the media as us doing the wrong thing. And I'm not saying that, you know, George Floyd was like the, the right way to handle anything at all. I'm saying like those really define how we evolve. And after George Floyd, almost everybody's, at least around here, our use of force policy statewide changed and were adapted. Right. And then you see like Minnesota going through a huge change right now. Yeah. No matter where it happens, it affects us no matter where we are as cops. And so the generation I think we're seeing now, especially coming out of covid, are just nervous to go hands on. I don't want to see scared. I want to say they're nervous because they're worried about going too hard or going not enough. And then they step back and, you know, you and I have this conversation about de-escalation all the time. And I, I love what you say about it. So I'm going to lead you into that. What do you say when it comes to de-escalation? So de-escalation, you can only de-escalate somebody that's engaging you. Right. If there's no engagement. So to me, de-escalation is if you're having a fight with your wife or with your husband, right, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, hopefully not a dog, but you're having an argument and there comes this point where they tune you out and all they hear is like barking and yapping. They're not hearing words. They're in their own head. They're in their own emotions. And the same thing happens with somebody that we're encountering, right? They're in their own amygdala too. They're scared too. Their fight or flight's kicking in. And then we're like, rough, 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 rough. And they're like, burr, 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 burr. there's no words. It's gone. And people think that de-escalation is the solve to everything. So it's funny watching the evolution of police work of the past 26 years, right? When I first came into police work in 1999, it was a masculine heavy profession. Nothing wrong with masculinity. You have to have masculinity. It's, it's a requirement. But it was like, we're going to fuck them up and we're going to crack their heads. And, we're gonna, and I'm like, oh, I've never cracked a head, really, right? Yeah. So now it's like this extreme other response. So the first thing I tell administrators is, there's a dirty component to law enforcement, and that is when force meets force, and it's dictated by the other person. So we have all these rules for us, right? Rules of engagement, uh, rules of when we can use certain weapons, rules of de-escalation, rules of documentation, accountability. There's nothing for that percentage of the population that goes all in on crime. If they want to kill you, they're not going, well, this really isn't a good thing, right? They've already said, fuck your social contract, I'm a criminal. Yeah. When you encounter that, you can't be like, well, I require a safe space to engage you. I don't believe in violence. I'm going to just talk to you. Right. There's a real big dangerous component to that. And that's not the reality of law enforcement. Like, it can be dirty. Yeah. And it's okay. We do the best that we can with what we have, not with malicious intent. And there's serious outcomes. But I've seen no true reform since George Floyd. Like the best thing that came out of that, in my opinion, was an attention to deficit in training for law enforcement. What real, ch I've seen it on paper, but I've never seen an influx of money for better training. I yeah. haven't seen like mass drive to, we're going to make training available. We're not going to deny training because of staffing. Like this is a real priority now. And we're really going to go out there and find the best training companies they have and bring it to you. Yeah. Not just send someone that we're going to, you're the next DT instructor, go take a 40 hour course. Now you teach everybody else. Like, do you understand this person has vicarious liability it, way beyond they retire? Yeah. Like they're going to go to, if shit goes bad, this is your person going to your state Supreme Court, to your federal court, your civil litigations. And they're like, I don't know that I can do that. Right? So it takes time. But unfortunately, I don't know if it's old administration mentality or what it is, or it's just that we have people in positions of power that don't understand the responsibility that we face. There's a video that just came out yesterday of a female officer who shot and killed a man and the headline read, officer shoots man with a marker. That paints a picture like they just walked up and shot somebody with a marker. Yeah. This person, it was an encounter. I don't know if it was a traffic stop, but it was, but he was aggressive. He was agitated. The body language is there and he's making these furtive gestures like he's either going to shoot her or stab her and then he charges her making a motion. She takes steps back, goes for cover, returns fire. Yeah. At that moment, what she's reading, what her eyes are telling her is happening is that there's a weapon and you're charging me. And the outrage is how dare you shoot a man with a marker? Whereas the narrative should be, wow, you had to shoot someone that was portraying themselves as armed. Fear is there, right? It's, it's, it's an amygdala, that's an amygdala hijack. I'm, I'm scared because I, I'm going to respond to real and perceived threats. And I shot someone I later found out was unarmed. Yeah. That's like, oh, fuck. That, that's life changing. Like it is. You know, and I think that's one of the misconceptions when it comes to people who aren't law enforcement officers. We don't sign up for this job to shoot and kill people. Nope. 
We don't even sign up this job to hurt people. Like at the foundation of what we do, we want to help. Mm -hmm. We literally want to just make the world a better place, right? Like Miss Congeniality with Sandra Bullock. Like I really just want world peace. Like I'd be happy <laughs> being out of a job if it meant yes. that everyone was just nice to each other. I mean, I realize that that's just not ever going to be, but that's what it comes down to. And then I love that you brought up a female because, you know, you, a couple things from your class that I took that I really loved. One was that one video that I actually made you send me because now I use it in my class too. The one with the female who had her gun out with a, a male that was, you know, got up and had been down and started coming after her and was like, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me. And she just didn't. And she played the game for a while. Yeah. And obviously she shouldn't have shot him because in looking at the view that I saw from her body cam, there wasn't a reason to shoot him. I agree. Yep. But she didn't necessarily know how to go to something else. And you know, I say it all the time and I, I know you practice, you know, martial arts and you and I met through defensive tactics and jujitsu and now I'm just obsessed with it. Uh, I mean, I'm nowhere near where I'm going to be, but I mean, at the tail end of my career, I'm the best I've ever been because of it. Yeah. Like, I wish that it was something there. And then you've got people like Matt and Scott with NJLEO jujitsu that are just like, let's just make sure that this is at the forefront of what police officers know how to do in order to be better prepared and be able to handle themselves. Women, especially because we don't we don't practice sports that allow for body movement to be learned as much as men do, right? We don't do football. We don't do wrestling. We don't do, uh, like, even with lacrosse, we're like a little bit, I mean, they still wear freaking skirts, I think, sometimes in like field hockey, right? We're not doing the same things that men do in order to learn how to move bodies. We're not necessarily as strong. Be the first person to say it, right? Everybody wants to talk about how women are equal. We're not equal. No one's equal. No. You and I are not equal. We deserve to be treated fairly, though. Correct. That's the difference. So I think as a bigger woman, and you can say the same thing, you're a bigger woman also. We're both, what, like 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, I've never... I love that you said I'm 5'8 or 5'9". I'm 5'7 and a half, but I'm wearing my boots to be 5'8". Thank you. You're welcome. But I've never been 130. I've never been 120. I think when I was born, I was 130. Like, that's about <laughs> it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in like, I don't know, sixth grade. I've always been like a very, a bigger muscular. So I can handle myself physically... But I, you know, I think it's really comes down to teaching people that it's okay to go hands on. So right? I have this thing that I say to whenever I teach DT for my agency or I do a law enforcement class, I always say there's no room for ideology and self-defense. Yeah. And I tell it to women when I do women's self-defense class. Right. Yeah. So whatever your beliefs are or your beliefs, that's fine. But they don't have a place in my world of at the moment of defending myself or somebody else because there are men and they're women and there's variety. Right. You have to the right side, to the other, very masculine, very not masculine, and that's okay. But understanding that, that there's differences in men and women. Women, for the most part, for the most part, are not drawn to combat sports. Agreed. Now, I've seen an uptick in it, which is awesome. Awesome. And I know one of the things that inspired me the most was when the women won the World Cup in 1999 and Brandy Chastain ran out to the field and pulled her top off and was shaking Hell it. Hell yeah. And she was like jacked and she had a sports bra and I said, that's probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. And yet, how much came out of that with them trying to say, why would you do that, right? So it's a, again, it's that double standard. Like, she, it's the same thing she would wear at the beach, but it, it defied the norm. Co correct. And it's okay to defy the norm. Agreed. But we have to understand that in our profession, where we go in it for good, right? Yes. A lot of our job is not the high-end extreme violence, depending where you police. Listen, you're in PG County, Maryland. You're in Trenton, you're in LA, you're in Miami. You have a different call volume than Dale. let's say, yeah, Dale <laughs> and Pitbull. If you're watching, we'd love to have you we come would. to our conference in Orlando. Yes, please. So totally tagging him. Please do. Uh, versus some very nice small rural, you know, Mayberry like town where it, it, the crime isn't there. But women have different obstacles the same way smaller statute men do. So a criminal element is, is a predator. They size you up, they look you up and down. When you grab them, are you grabbing them gentle and ginger? Or are you even, like, I don't think some female officers realize they go into, like, mom mode. And yeah. they talk to, like, a guy who's got to go to jail, like, I'm trying to talk my kid into eating Brussels sprouts. So we have to be aware of these things, learn how to train around it, and be like, listen, you can be empathetic, you can be compassionate. But when someone's resisting arrest and trying to take your head off, that's the time to go is now. Yeah, and, and on top of that, I, I think that women only know there, it's very hard to get into that middle ground of me coming off as being very authoritative and seeming like a bitch or bitch or being a little too soft and seeming seemingly being like a wuss right or like a mom and it's finding that middle ground 
And as I'm going around and I'm meeting all these officers from different agencies in different states, I'm finding that the number one complaint from a lot of them, especially in regard to use of force, is when they say, my guys just won't let me get involved. And they want to, not just to prove themselves, because they want to feel like they're contributing, right? They Mm want to be in there and they want to know that they can handle themselves at the same time. And it's, I think it's taken me almost, yeah, I mean, I'm at about 20 years to realize that even my guys are like, you know, hey, LT, like stay back. And I'll be like, what do you mean stay back? I can handle myself. And they'll be like, yeah, but you don't have to. We've got it. Right. But I'm at that stage now. So it's, it's that balance. I mean, there was a year that I led use of force as a sergeant. <laughs> we have this conversation all the time. And I mean, granted, almost all of them are women and the guys don't like to go hands on with women the same way they will with men. They just they just don't. They feel like it's OK to show more force, physical force with a man if they're a man than they do with a woman. So they're like LT. And I'm like, can we just get this over with? Like, she's under arrest. Let's go. Yeah, I, I really wish I could change that one thing. But I think it's an, it's like inherently human. Right. We, ha- we have things that are just make us human. Yeah. And when I do use of force reviews and I've reviewed, I've probably reviewed thousands of videos in my career as a DT instructor and then as a program manager. Right. When men get hurt, primarily like it comes out of the blue. I call it out of the blue, but it's not like we saw it coming is when they placate and patty cakes with a female that is drunk. Oh, yeah. I would rather fight a full blown man who does not want to go to jail than a drunk woman because amen, my face is going to get sh- like the fight's coming. Yeah. Right? Tops are coming off. They're just horrible, horrible, horrible yeah, encounters. They'll, go, and they'll, they'll do the whole Jersey Shore. Let me take my earrings off. So for me, if you're a drunk woman, you're going to, I, I, I'm like, I hit fast and hard. When I grab you, it's fast and hard. I don't do this in between like gentle, like a prom date. Like it's, it's efficient. And I'm showing you with the first grab, I'm exerting my dominance and my force on you. I'm grabbing you. Yeah. It's a psychological game, right? And then I always see our male officers that get like that random slap or they come out of their cuffs because there's this thing of, oh, it's a woman. Let me be more gentle. And my whole thing is, listen, that can be you outside of it. It could be you 99, but not when you're making an arrest. Yeah. Right. Being efficient and effective isn't being brutal and excessive. Ooh, say that again. Being efficient and effective is not being brutal and excessive. Because when we're not, we create opportunities for more force to be used. That is so good. That's, that's all it is, right? And if you're able to just say that and justify and understand, we're understanding human body, human dynamics, yeah. right? If I don't control you efficiently, I create opportunities for you not to hurt me. If I shut it down fast, now it's, and then de-escalate before. You can de-escalate during. I don't want to hurt you, man. You're causing this to yourself. Stop pushing back. You're going to tear your shoulder up. At the end, are you done? It's over. Right? You're in custody, you're going to jail. There's no, don't fight anymore. It's done. So you can do that, but you can't rely on anyone too. You can't rely on just your gun, just your taser, just your handcuffs drive me insane. Right? They just drive me insane because I've seen so many videos in my own agency too. We're holding this thing. Like, shh, stop resist, uh, but let go of the fucking handcuffs. Control, then handcuff. And there's only one way to do it. Agreed. Training. With your people. Yes. Right? Because that's so key. Again, uh, you know, I, I got into jujitsu and the guys in my agency are way better than me. They've been training a long time, you know, blue belts. Uh, we, we have purple belt. We actually just hired this female. She's in the academy now. She's like super close to brown belt. She's like awesome. five foot two and tiny. And I just love her. Uh, but for me, what's really great about I, it's not my agency anymore as of it'll always be part of your agency yesterday and congratulations by the way thank you very much it's weird i'm a civilian for three weeks it's very weird i'm gonna like go fuck shit up and not worry (laughs) about it right so you know uh we are allowed a full hour to work out and so on night shift we would train jujitsu together and just the difference with us showing up on scene together and not even having to really talk but be having that comfort level of knowing how their bodies move and mine moves and the look and knowing that we're comfortable i mean even when we had use of force incidents, they were just de-escalated so quickly. And we were able to, I mean, just grab onto someone the right way and work together yeah. and just communicate because we were learning from each other off the road on the mats. And then when we got on the road, like, I know you're good for this. So you stand there. Like, you're good for this. We're good. And I could just direct it better. And I am, I'm a huge fan. Like, I, my father uh, competed in judo as a kid. Oh, yeah. He, he, he was uh, from Cuba. He went to Spain. He competed internationally, always loved judo. He opened a small judo studio for a while when I was like four or five in Michigan. 
And then he just got away from it because he became an accountant. And I don't know, something happens to us when we age where we think we can't do the fun, cool shit anymore. And then you just become like this couch potato and you almost create this new role, right? Well, I'm 50 now. I can't, listen, I'm 45 and I'm doing more shit than I did when I was 23. And I'm 43. Right? And so, I only just started jujitsu when I was 40. Well, I started when I was 40. Just 42. And six weeks post full hip replacement, I started. Yeah, I remember you telling me. Yeah. We were doing takedowns. You went, I just had my hip replaced. I was like, who is this woman? Like, <laughs> like Robocop, like, man. Like, what the fuck is happening? But yeah. So be listen, best rehab I probably could have done. I mean, I walked into my surgeon. He's like, I don't understand how you're doing this well. I'm like, well, I, it was jujitsu. He's like, you mean what I told you not to do? I'm like, yeah, but the people I rolled with knew that that was a limitation of yeah. mine. You know, people are so worried about getting on that mat and it being new and that uncomfortableness that comes along with it with doing anything. And then you add that type A machismo personality of who we are as cops because yep. we have to be in control. It's very hard to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to look weak or like we don't know what we're doing. And when you get on the mat, it's not about going 100%. It's about learning how other people's bodies move and the skill level you have in order to control them. So I, I love all martial arts. And I, I think there's a place for everything. Like, so I'm not one of these that says only do that. Yeah. I think the best for us is jujitsu because of the control aspect. Agreed. But I've always said I want to hit like a boxer. Mm -hmm. I want to kick like a Muay Thai guy. I want to have the takedown of a wrestler or a judo guy. And I want to have the control of a jujitsu grappler. Yeah. That, that's, that's my big philosophy. I love it. But I don't want to punch you in the face when I'm working as a cop. I can. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to break my hands and then do six weeks light duty in admin. Right. right. I, I don't want to miss and hit the concrete or I break my hand and I can't draw my gun. Right. So I still have to be a working machine for the next part of this fight. But you hit the nail on the head. There's a comfort level to jujitsu. It's very humbling. Like I can stand in front of a bag. I can spar. Right. I can do certain things. But when I'm doing live training and I am completely dominated and controlled, all I have to do is find a better place for me to breathe, relax, and I'll pin my gun side. Right. Because there's a moment of panic. The, the, and I'm not going to lie. Like, I felt like, oh, my God, this must be what prison feels like. Like the first time, like I was under turtle. First of all, I'm under a man ugh. who's smaller than you. But the guy has this. He can put all his body weight on a dime on your chest. It's and unbelievable. It's just you're humble. And I'm humbled by the women that I train with. Like Coach Chris, she's a beast. Beast. So nice. So unassuming. But then you get on the match there and you're like. So what does it teach me as a cop? Clear head, clear thinking. Slow my breathing. Don't put myself in a worse spot. Can I get to a radio? Can I just advance my position at all to get to my gun? Yeah. What am I? Now, obviously, I, I preach, obviously, as law enforcement, if I can bite it, I'm going to bite it. If I can grab it, I'm going to grab it. If I can stick it in a hole, I'm going to stick it in a hole, right? Yeah. Pen to ear. Like, if it's a fight for your life, yeah. weapons of opportunity go. But you can only think like that if you're calm enough. But you also have to have somebody who's going to give you permission yes. to do that, right? So if you are in a situation and you work for an agency that doesn't train and doesn't do anything and doesn't allow you to feel as though you can do whatever you need to in order to go home safe mm -hmm. in a certain situation, you're not going to. And no, that's what's leading to getting our cops injured more and, her and killed. If there's a hesitancy that happens from point of arrest beyond that the only way it's, it's training through the freeze, right? Everybody talks about fight or flight. But the third F is freeze. And you only combat freezing through training. And then who's doing the training? How are they doing the training? So you have to have someone that can put it all together. Like, it's great to do, pick anything. I don't care. But if you don't apply proper context, because we have rules. We have rules of engagement. So it can't all be, you know, elbow strikes, ball grab. Unless I can elbow strike and ball grab. And how yeah. do I do that? By recognizing the scenario that is dictated by them. I'm responding to your force. I can't just walk up and like, you know, judo chopping the neck because you said I'm not giving you my ID. But if you start going for my gun, it's game on. And there shouldn't be any surprise or disgust by the public when somebody tries to kill a cop and the cop then kills them in return. It's a justifiable homicide. That's why that code exists, right? It's justifiable. Yep. In the course of my duties, you try to kill me. Don't be surprised. This happened to you. Hey, everybody. I'm Heather Gologlich, instructor here for Street Cop Training for the course The Complete Female Cop. This class is not just for females. It's not just about gender specific issues. It was really formed in order to allow people to find that passion again for policing, to understand that their self identity doesn't need to be changed just because they want to fit the mold and to really help bring about change 
change in the profession, not just for women, but for everybody to be heart led servant leaders. If you're interested in taking the course, you can visit streetcop.com and search Heather Gologolich and you'll be able to find it. I'm also really excited to announce that I have a new course coming out. It's going to be called Be the Change. Some of the great feedback I got from this year's conference in Nashville was that the men in this profession didn't feel like they wanted to take a spot away from the women that they work with for my first course that I teach. And so I was really able to sit down and put it together a course about culture change and building effective teams and learning about a growth mindset versus stagnation mindset, pushing forward and just being the best cop that you can be both personally and professionally. So really excited for that to be coming out soon. Keep an eye out for it. Thank you all so much. Stay safe and be the change. So let's transition into the role of a supervisor, reviewing use of force Mm -hmm. and how we can better prepare our officers or whoever we're working with to use the right amount of force and feel seen and backed up by their because you and I had this conversation yeah. too about who's reviewing use of force reports and how are you interpreting what happened and are you guiding your officers to be able to articulate what needs to be articulated like here's the policy the words that you can use in your report are right here right active assailant what, whatever you want to look for is right there for you why aren't you utilizing it in your report so so tell me some advice that you would have for people that are supervisors that have to review use of force incidents so supervisors in my opinion the best they can do is be humble enough to know what you don't know which is you have to know your case law if you you, ha- you can't critique an officer out of fear because you don't know what the law is and i see that a lot then i see supervisors do this well i wouldn't have done that no one gives a shit what you would do was it lawful does it meet the Graham Connor test? And was it within policy? Then you could say humbly, you know what? Have you thought about trying this? But you better come from a place of knowledge if you say, did you try this? Right? So supervisors, I find, because they tell me this all the time, I'm sending you a use of force review. I don't know. You take a look at it. And I go, what didn't you like about it? Well, I don't know. I don't think you can do that. What did you double check? Like, do you know the law? Do you know what Graham is? Do you know articulation? Supervisors, it's funny because I have this conversation sometimes. Like, we take supervisory classes, right? Empathy-based leaders, service leadership. Are you autocratic? What are you, what are you doing? Are you a tyrant? What are you doing? Yeah. You can read every book under the fucking stars, but if you can't translate and apply it and understand that all leadership styles will apply at one point in time, then you're already behind the eight ball, right? Because a manager is different than a leader. And sometimes we put the wrong ones in the wrong spots. We do. You want to be, be a good street sergeant? You want to be a good lieutenant on patrol? Know the policy. Know the law. Listen to what your officer said and understand that when they're telling you something, it's from their point of view at that time. And I want to just piggyback on that. Know your people as well. So 100%. Right. So if I have one of my officers who is extremely skilled at jujitsu and he goes in and just takes an elbow to somebody's face, I'm going to I'm going to question him outside of it and be like, okay, you know, I'm looking at the scenario and obviously it was justified, but you know better. Right. Or if I have a brand new female who's got who's very tiny and instead she brings out her baton with somebody charging her instead of going hands on. I'm going to understand that better because that's her or even I mean, I have a lot of small guys I work with, too, but most of my guys train. So, you know, I just I think it's everything you said and then also knowing your people. And I I'm going to transition that into leadership completely and just outside the scope of use of force. Knowing your people is essential to being a great leader and helping them be the best versions of themselves. But also when you're talking about your people, you have to realize that just because you would do it one way and they do it another doesn't mean the way that they did it was wrong if you still come out to the same outcome. And that is the biggest, I mean, humbling aspect of me transitioning from a pretty shitty sergeant, I will be very, very, very honest about it, into being a lieutenant who really started to say, you know what? Yeah, I would have done that differently. But you still did it right, and we got the same result. And that's on everything, investigations, yeah. no matter who, how you're talking to somebody, how you might de-escalate somebody. My job is to try and give you other options and help you be more holistic, and maybe my advice to you will help. But again, I don't think that we're, we're recognizing people's areas of strength and then areas that might need improvement. I don't call it things weaknesses. I just don't do it, right? Like We don't have a weak hand anymore when we shoot. We have a support hand. Support hand, yeah. So there's no such thing in my life as a weakness. It's areas that might need improvement. The other thing, too, the the roadside IA, like, how how do you speak to your... So we treat our own officers, and I'm going to say we because I'm part of the collective we, right? We as, as As a whole institution sometimes, when supervisors get on scene, we treat our own officers like they're an offender in a crime. And the way they ask them what happened, it's very accusatory. So here's my philosophy. This is what I always taught the sergeants that I mentored and worked with me. 
when you get on a use of force scene, if the officer that used force is still engaging, get in the fucking force. When it's done, separate that officer immediately from them, not for any other reason than to give you time to decompress because anybody that tells you being assaulted isn't personal has never been assaulted. Agreed. It's as fucking personal as it gets. Yeah. Right? Take him to the side. And the first question is always, are you okay? Yeah, but this, no, 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 no. I'm going to ask you what happened. Are you good? Yeah. Are you hurt? Take five minutes. Go to the cruiser or get some water for the OC. You stay with officer so-and-so. I'm going to ask everybody else, get him in the car. Are we done searching? If they're being assholes and they're just fighting, get him to the jail right away. Then I ask them, what happened? <sighs> no, no, relax, relax, relax. You're not in trouble. Just relax. Just tell me what happened. Talk me through it. Yeah. Right? I don't like letting them watch their body camera too soon either because that body camera is a blessing and a curse. I'm a big believer in use of force. That body camera is watched way after you write the report, way after. And I'll tell you why. Use of force is the only thing that comes from your opinion. What is your objective opinion on what happened? What did you feel? What did you see? How did it make you feel? Right? He flailed his nostrils. He charged his head. He came at you. I was scared. Right? He has got cauliflower ear. He had nunchucks. Whatever the fucking case is. If I watch body camera, and body camera captures whatever the hell it's pointed at. Yeah. And it's got a limited depth of field. It doesn't capture emotion. It doesn't capture intuition. It doesn't capture beyond the lens. Right? So if I watch that too soon, let's say I have an OIS. And I thought they pulled the gun. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I came from the waistband. It was black. I saw the handle. And then I go, oh, Jesus Christ, it was a fucking phone. I shot a guy with a phone. Yeah. I didn't mean to. Maybe I didn't see a gun. Maybe it was always a phone. Right? Don't fuck with your head like that. It's what you had at that moment, like trying to justify exigency. Why did you kick in the door? Because I felt I had to. Well, you didn't have to. Well, you can tell me that now, 40 minutes later, asshole. Right. But at that time, I made my decision. So we have to trust them, right? Give them the foundation, give them the training, but trust their decision. And if something is incorrect, address it, train it. But at that moment, you weren't there. Right. You can't tell them what they felt. And we do that sometimes. And it's like, stop it. Yeah, that Monday morning quarterbacking, it, Okay, so it's important Correct. if we do it the right way. Yes. To learn, right? So let me give you two, two scenarios, right? So the one video that you show, and I don't know where it's out of, but the one that I took from you and I use it <laughs> mine too because it's awesome, is a female with a male and he's on the ground and it's a female cop and she has her gun pointed at him and it's pr a good couple minutes of him charging at her saying, then just fucking kill me, fucking kill me. I'm gonna fucking kill you, blah, blah, blah. She's like, I don't wanna kill you. I don't wanna kill you. I don't." Want and she's going and she's going. And then um, a male white shirt cop gets out. So he obviously had some kind of um, rank, gets out, immediately just pulls his taser, gets the guy on the ground, right? And everybody, and even myself, it's just, I, it's human nature for us to be like, why wouldn't she do this? Why didn't she do this? Why didn't she do that? So in my class, what I do, especially because I feel as though women are the worst to women in this career, oh, yeah. right? Like we're, we're the mean girls. You can't sit with us. We fought to get here and I'm going to make it hard for you to fight because I don't want to feel, you know, less than or whatever. But so for me, after I showed that, you know, it was it was literally like perfect and I didn't plan on it, but all of them are like, oh, my God, blah, blah, blah. And they're like chit chatting about it. And I'm like, wow. Right. They're like, yeah, I would go. What would you guys have d done? And they went into it. I go, all right. So let me ask you this. What if I told you that she just got back from work because she shot a kid who had a cell phone instead? And so now she's worried about having to shoot this guy because of how it's going to look. And they were like, oh, shit. I'm like, I don't know if that's the truth. And there could be. And they're like, okay, we don't trust you anymore. I'm like, well, that's, my point is, is that we always look at things from a perspective of immediacy, how we would have reacted without trying to take into account all the things that you just talked about, you know, who we are, what we've been through, our perspective, our emotion, the things that you might not be able to see that are around you. And the second example that I want to use is with uh, Dante Wright and Kim Potter. Yep. So, um, when you watch the video, there are so many things that you can teach other officers that they didn't do, right? That, that could have maybe prevented what happened. One, they could have shut the door, brought him around back. But neither Kim Potter nor the guy that she was training had a hold of him like you talk about, right? You're under arrest. You're under arrest. You're mine. And you're now my responsibility, too. Oh, yeah. So why wouldn't you hold on to somebody in a way where they can't get away? Instead, again, we're in this whole entire you know, mindset that I believe the media has cre created 
about the fact that we have to be kinder and gentler. And with kinder and gentler, it means not being as forceful when we need to be. Correct. Which in turn now leads to a use of force incident where she felt she had to pull out her taser, went to use her taser, didn't know that she had her gun and shot and killed him with one shot. Right. So, again, we talk about all these little things, all these minute details and comfortability and having to worry about also being judged after the fact. And how judged is she now? Right. Six months in prison. For, for, and she legitimately did not want to shoot him. She wanted to tase him. She says it right on there. Again, ownership is on her and her agency for not properly training her. But ownership is on her, too. And, and that's what I preach in my class to the women. Right. There are stigmas about women in policing that we're not we're strong enough. <laughs> that, yeah. That we're badge bunnies. We're yeah, badge bunnies. Yep. Uh, that we are too emotional, that we're not tactical and we're not strong enough. And while those stigmas are can be true. It's also our responsibility to change that stigma and take ownership of that stigma and make sure that we're putting in the work and not just showing up to be another person as part of manpower, right? Like do the work, train the gun, train defensive tactics, like eat better, feel better, do all those things. You know, don't, and listen, I'm never going to put down somebody for relationships. Like I have found out from traveling, which is insane to me, that there are some states that are at will states where officers don't have a union or maybe they do, but they can be fired at any time. Us. It's crazy to me. We are, we it's, are a, it's, called, it's called a right to work state. It's unbelievable to I me. I think we have two jurisdictions that have a union because they had like voted no confidence against their chiefs and actually have the third one brought a union in. Yeah. So now Virginia's like, oh, are we going to become a union state or not? Um, maybe one day, I don't know, but I don't have the protection of a union. It's crazy. You know, I have a due process. If I have discipline, I go through the disciplinary, um, all the steps and, I've been suspended and I've got days off and I get fired. I can appeal that and it goes to my circuit court judge and I can, you know, pick a representative. So it's not that fast. Like the first year it is, but it's still not like other states that have protection and have a union fighting for them. Right. Right. My lawyer is out of my pocket. Nobody's paying that. But, but, but me. Oh, see, we have legal protection plan in New Jersey. Obviously, it depends on what happens and Correct. whether or not we're going to get covered. But, you know, I want to go back to like what I was saying about everybody judges people and they don't know what's going on. And this, this is just a foundational thing for supervisors and any law enforcement officer to realize, like you want to talk about Laverne, and, you know, and everybody wants to talk about that girl yep. from that department. But what if she works in an at will state and she was told that if you don't do this, you are going to lose your job. Of course. Right. Or it's just, it again, so grace has to come from everybody throughout yeah. law enforcement. And that's the evolution. I think of female leadership here too allowing people to feel vulnerable, allowing people to see different sides and bringing in people that are different with di different circumstances and allowing the men we work to work with and for to show a little bit more of emotion and it be acceptable because if they see us being that way, they can bring it in too. Yeah, and you got to be forgiving. Like I am not a super emotional woman at all. Oh, I am. I was that raised, might be our only difference. I was raised, you know, by a series of single women. Like it was my mom and her sisters all got married and divorced at one time. And we grew up in one house. I'm the first generation born in this country. My family fled Cuba. So when a kid here complains about not having their VR, or they lost their phone. I'm like, you have no concept of loss. Yeah. And when you come in a household like that, the first thing you learn is, well, the first thing you learn is patriotism, right? Like, yeah. Th thank God for America because we had a place to flee to. Yeah. I was raised on, on meritocracy. Because we went from sharing homes to each child uh, that my grandparent had became successful in their own right. From New York City sales to head sales of Levelor when they were around to having their own, you know, Ford Bay transmission shop, family farm in New Jersey. Like they all succeeded never once on a government dime. Now, not to say that you can't take government assistance. Of course you can. But that was never their goal. Like their goal was we fled government. We're going to make it on our own backs. So I grew up with literally, I remember my grandmother died. My mom said to me, don't you cry. I need you strong. So it was like, whoop, shut it down, right? Oh, yeah. Like, th there was no room for emotion because emotion was weakness. Yeah. So then I go into a profession where it was like, well, wait a minute. I have to have some emotion, right? I have to be empathetic and be okay with being empathetic. So there's men that are told, don't be empathetic, don't cry, don't be emotional. No, no, bullshit. I need you to be as emotional as I need a woman to be masculine and aggressive. So take these terms, aggressiveness, empathy, and stop making them a sign of weakness or gender specific and understand what it is. It's a spectrum of human emotion that you're going to come across with people anyway. So maybe you can empathize with that, right? That's like the first thing. And then for some of like the younger officers, I'm like, where is your aggression button? Like, where is your time to engage filter? Like, this is like, you're not reading this room because why? 
we grew up on this. They grew up on virtual reality. They grew up on, uh, uh, or, or gee, mom, leave me alone. I'm bothered by this. It's like, okay, Johnny, here's your safe space. It's like, like we talk about it like a joke, but it's becoming like a real fucking trend. Yeah. Like you can really, do you really believe that you're entitled to a safe space from a word? And then you're going to apply to be a cop. And then you're going to take all your ideology, all of your philosophies, right? Whatever it may be. And then tell someone, so you're under arrest. And they're going to go, and you're going to go, oh, your computer just got rebooted. Right. And now that's going to shake you to the core because guess what? No one gives a fuck what you think when they're determined to be a criminal. Yep. There's about four to six percent of the population like this dude just beat his mother. You think he gives a shit about a 24 year old wet behind the ear rookie cop who doesn't believe in violence? Yeah. You gonna come across an institutionalized criminal that has killed people. And then you're going to tell him, sir, uh, you can't smoke marijuana in public. And he's going to go, OK. Like we set people up for failure by this packaged sense of what Shangri-La should be in the news, right? And then it's like, right, it's, it's, like, it's like the difference between porn and actually having sex. This is a vastly different world. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, I love that analogy. It's, it's, it is, and then, but we also have to manage that expectation up. Yeah. Because they feel the pressure. Agreed. The, the media-driven pressure of, of how evil law enforcement can be and how we can just shoot them in the leg, right? Or just talk to them. Yeah. You can't talk to someone who's stabbing you in the face. Right. They've committed to an act. So I think that agencies need to do better. The same way you want to get on social media and go coffee with a cop, ice cream with a cop, junior police academy, you know, we change the tire. Get on there and say, that's not what happened. We can't. Fight that false narrative. Yeah. <clears throat> but you've got people saying like, nope, you can't release the body cam footage. You can't do that. You can't do that. And so that false narrative just gets bigger, right? You want to talk about uh, Michael Brown? Yes. Oh, yes. Right. I mean, if we really delved into that entire case study, it's just it really came down to, you know, people were so angry that his body laid there for how long? Well, yeah, but what they're not telling you is that you've got people who are citizens or civilians like shooting off rounds and the yep. cops can't get in. Right. Or the fact that they had to lie about what they saw, the neighbors in fear of what the re retaliation would be from their own people in their own neighborhood. Breonna Taylor, the only thing the news got right or celebrities got right was her name and gender and race. Yeah, that was it from that case. And that's the thing. Right. So I'm one of those. And it's funny because the first podcast I did, I said something about how we compromise officers uh, due process in the name of social justice. Right. Or what is perceived as social justice. And there was somebody and I don't know why I read the comment because you told me don't read the comments. I read the comments. I did tell you that. And there was some ass hat that got on there They're like, Dennis, quit having rookies on your show. You don't know what. And I was just like, my, you can see the steam coming out of my ears. But then, and then I took a step back and I went, you know what? If you're this vocal on a thread, it's because you're not vocal anywhere else and you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Love it. Because when you compromise due process and you compromise the law based on opinion, now we've lost our very foundation, right? Like our constitution, our laws are supposed to be what make us a rock solid, stable nation. And if I start bending them and breaking them for your whim, now I got a problem. Like, like you don't want officers showing way, you don't want subjective arrests. You don't want subjective use of force because. Our perspectives are different. Yeah. So for me, it's like, I wish I could take like every keyboard warrior and just smack him in the mouth one time, <laughs> right? Just stop it. Or have him just show up to a jujitsu event, right? Yeah, or better yet, I hope you have heart surgery. You tell your surgeon how you think it should be done. We'll never see you again. There you go. But our profession is one that everybody does better than us, right? It doesn't matter that we've got collectively almost fucking 60 years of professional training and then some asshat on his couch in his mother's house is like, I want to do it that way. Yeah. Well, good for you. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, when we talk about that Chicago cop who took down uh, that guy, it, her name is Michelle, and um, you had Crowder on his little podcast oh, yeah. wearing his little, you know, I have to keep my chest up straight because I had surgery because I had a concave chest and whatever and I'm weak. And he starts to complain about all these things and he says that she's a diversity hire and that she needed a man and that she went to her tool belt and all these things. And again, it was this responsibility that I felt I had to speak up and I read your post. everybody was coming in my DM and I'm like, oh man, this is like not where I wanted to go. I, and I go, I guess here we go. Right. And again, it was, I was shocked to find out that he actually trains jujitsu because anyone yeah. who does knows that whether her failed foot trip was failed or not, she attempted it. And then she used her body weight and grappling to pull him down to the ground. Right. And then she placed him under arrest. She didn't call for a female cop or a male cop. She just called for a cop. Because at that time, she was trying to do what was right. She was trying to take somebody into custody that had just physically assaulted 
someone at a convenience store and she came upon him. And while being video recorded by one of the lead gang members in her area who was probably strapped, she did it on her own. Five foot two of her. Right. Like and, you know, even when I posted inside Street, street Cop or whatever I did, like there were guys in the group that started to come back at me and they're like, oh, you're being too sensitive. You're damn right. I'm being sensitive because, again, here we are. And if it was you that was being Monday morning quarterbacked or you that was being called out on something that you, even you were doing right or wrong, you would get all hit in the ass about it. So, yeah, I did take that personal and I did allow my emotions to go in because I felt like she was getting pulled in all these different directions. And, you know, you had people like Tim Kennedy say what a phenomenal yeah. job that she did. Right. But again, well, because Tim Kennedy is an actual I love he him. actually has combat experience. Right. He's actually been a fighter. So. Th so here's the thing. Uh, of course, I get sensitive when it comes to law enforcement. Right? I, I'm one of these people like I'm more on the side of, listen, I don't believe in, in like civilian boards. Like I have a strong opinion against civilian boards, not against the concept, but against the actual civilian board itself, because. I don't ask my mother in law to mediate my marriage. Right. If an agency is doing their investigations and issuing discipline that's not for someone else to second guess if you have an issue contact doj we'll have a consent decree or investigate or contact local news but i don't bring out outside entities that are not sworn that have no training or experience tell me about graham connor or explain to me my own amygdala hijack or tell me about reaction times if you don't understand those things you should not be speaking on use of force because then you don't understand the fear factor they had or why it looked like they shot somebody in the back like do you know how long it takes to go 180 present it gonna go back no so then shut up yeah. Like, stop it. Like, get educated or stop it, right? But that's me. But that whole scenario is like, listen, I know people that train professionally. I've watched professional fighters go into the ring and then just have to hold on for dear life. Doing use of force training sometimes means that we hold on for dear life, call for backup, and just don't put yourself in a worse spot. It's going to be ugly. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. I'm going to smack myself in the face because it's force and force. It's not fucking choreographed dancing. Yeah. Stop going off of television. Right. Stop going off of these fucking movies where it looks like oh, I'm going to do this. and It's perfect. Men fuck it up. Women fuck it up. And we fuck it up as a group. Right. They have. And, and Steven Crowder, as far as I know, and I like him as far as some of his commentary. Like, I don't have to agree with everything everybody says. I can find value in anybody, whether it's what I don't ever want to repeat again. Amen. Or what I want to disagree with. Right. Like, oh, there's value. Yeah. Right? But even when Joe Rogan love Joe Rogan podcast, I love his guests. Sometimes he goes on a tangent on police officers and it's like. You're not speaking from a place of, of information, right? You're not talking from a place of institu institutional knowledge. But that one, he, I don't think Steven Crowder ever was a cop or ever had a gun pointed at him or ever had a, mo I, not that I know of. Not that I know of either. Tim Kennedy has. He does like to berate his pregnant wife on his ring camera, though, for everybody to see. I so saw that too. Her girlfriend, whatever she is. Yeah, so, we pay, so we get to be sensitive because we pay a price for the women that fucked it up for us before. Because... I'm, I'm in the shadows of every other woman that was at my agency and every other agency that maybe, like, I know I was, I think I was a diversity hire, but it worked out well because I'm competent, right? Like, I, I'm like, listen, lesbian, Cuban, female, or white male, right? What, what do you, come on over, right? Like, <laughs> what everything. do you identify as today? Right? Wait, whatever. So, and whatever, but I'm one that came out, well, I worked, right? I'm, I'm, I'm efficient. I'm effective. I'm not incompetent. Yeah. Some people are. Even if they weren't a diversity hire, because I did hiring for four years and I had the six months of like the perfect relationship in the first three weeks of hiring. Like nobody comes to you as a total shit show. It's, it's best foot forward. They're clean and they have clear answers. And oh my God, your background is great. Then you hire them and they're a shit show. I have to make a decision to hire in a very small amount of time. So, but I know the mistakes I pay for and it's everybody else before me and my own mistakes. Yeah. But goddamn, people are not forgiving sometimes. No. And they love to just rip us as a whole. And then understand that as a female, you're already at a physical disadvantage. Like I've always chased, like I love to lift weights. I love to work out. I love, I love aggression. I'm very comfortable in the world of violence. It's my home. I'm okay with it. But when I grab a man, I know I'm grabbing a man. Like it's not, like there's no competition there. Like I might be stronger than a small percentage of men, but testosterone is the wonder, it's the wonder drug for a reason versus estrogen, which fuck you estrogen. Um, <laughs> right? Like yeah. I, but make no mistake about it. It's going to work me. Like I have to work harder and, and I, I have to be prepared for that. And I think there's some men out there that couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag. Agreed. Their, their, phys their physicality is gone. Their mental grit isn't there, right? They're complacent. They're slobs. Like we have some, we don't have calendars. Firefighters have calendars. Why don't we have calendars? Because most of us don't work out. 
It's just, it's just, we're reactive. We're constantly under stress. I know some people you work with that could be on a calendar. Yeah, I have a couple. <laughs> I couldn't do, I couldn't do 12 month calendar, but I probably got a solid four months out of, out of one. Right? <laughs> we could put you in June. Yeah, I could do June. Get it? I got you. All right. Oh, I got you. <laughs> I just had a day. I grew up with a day. Now it's a whole month. I don't know how the fuck that month. happened. Hey, because why not? Why not? I have 12. Actually, I get 12 months out of a year. So, uh, you know, it's just I love what you just said about how and people are going to try and argue with us. Right. And we're going to get the comments about, oh, uh, why would you ever say that women aren't equal? I, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying no one is equal. We all bring our own strengths and to the table to make a great team. Right. Like that's what makes a great team, recognizing where people are good and where they might need a little help and bringing that all together and making like a unique holistic team. But again, we are, we're, we're the, we are the weaker gender as a whole. Yeah. Structurally. Structurally we are right. So when I roll jujitsu, it doesn't matter if I'm going against a blue belt or a purple belt, if they're a girl, if they're most of the time, they're a lot smaller than me. I can just use my sheer muscle and my sheer ability to put top pressure on and I can hold them down. It doesn't matter what they do. I have to get them there first. When I roll against a guy who maybe has zero training at all, it's different. but if he's bigger, he's, he's going, I'm not going to be able to, you know, sweep him. I'm just not, I don't have that strength to do it. I'll get there. I'll learn it. I'll learn different techniques, but yeah, it's just, it's really understanding what, what your own strengths are. Yeah. And me saying that men are stronger than me doesn't diminish my own strength. Amen. Oh, it, it doesn't. Ooh. Right. Just acknowledging that it doesn't make yeah. me less of a woman. It doesn't, it doesn't make me less of anything. Yeah. There's always a bigger, better dog out there. Oh, yeah. Right. Because eventually we all age out and then the new kids are on the block and then it's just the cycle of life. Yeah. But there's this hesitation to say that. And it's it does a disservice. If I don't tell female officers men are stronger than you or if you come across a, a 2 percent of the population that are these CrossFit and animal, you know, like Sam Bailey or, or, or Tia Toomey, that are just these monster women that could do with me as they wish. You're going to walk into a scenario and go, I see no bias. I see no gender. I'm going to arrest this person. And not acknowledge that it's a six foot four man that's got traps touching the top of his fucking head. Yeah. And you're, you're going to just dominate him by, by your sheer will alone. That's, that's, that's make believe world. And that's fine at home. But not fine when the, 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 the community is trusting you to be effective, efficient, save them, protect them, right? Be good at your job. And that means sizing up an opponent, right? The human brain doesn't work that way. Like, my shit's frying trying to see the world the way they want us to see it today. The brain doesn't, doesn't look at you and not see gender or description or race. It has to categorize you. Yeah. So stop telling cops not to do that because we have to look. I'm looking at posture, indicators. Are you leaning? Are you hiding? Are you looking away? Are you target glancing my gun? Are, are you, you bleeding? Flexing? Yeah. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Like, I have to, I have yeah. to make these deductions, right? Stereotyping or discrimination as far as being discriminant. Is that a bad thing? I, I discriminate on who I have sex with. That, that's by right, right? Like, don't say you're not, you don't discriminate people. Like, you have a category. This will do, this height, right? This look, this appeal, this characteristic. But to merely arrest or belittle or, you know, use excessive force on someone because of an, uh, an immutable fact, that is wrong and heinous and disgusting. I don't know many people. I, don't, I have never met a cop that did that. Same. Never. And if anything, during George Floyd, you know who got it the worst? My fellow black officers on my squad, rookies, that the people, that, the, the things that people were saying to them, I don't think I've heard KKK sermons that nasty. Yeah. Coming from, quote unquote, their own group or their own race or their own culture. That was, I was, and all because we wear the same, you want to see diversity? Pull the, the water officers across the U.S. There isn't a group we don't represent, but we get painted with a broad brush because that's what the media does. Because we Bad wear the same uniform. That's right. Bad media. They, they take this symbol of the thin blue line and they want to make it a symbol of hate. It's like, if you understood the thin blue line, that's, that's what separating you between good and evil. And we'll die side by side to save you. Not to cover for each other. There's nobody harder on a bad cop than a cop. Hey, oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Like, we will eat our own. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then spit them out. Because we're not going to pay or set the, set the way for someone else to judge us all because you were a donkey. Like, what did you do? I think it was the New York City uh, Union, the Supervisors Union, the Sergeants Union that came out right after George Floyd. And they had a press conference. I want to say it was New York. And they were like, we're not, we're not that cop. Like, don't hate us. That's we, awesome. We denounced what he did. Didn't matter. I mean, things still happened. City still burned. Yeah. I remember they protested in my city and they were like, well, the eight can't wait was the campaign slogan. 
and it was only use chokeholds and lethal force. We're like, we do that. Yeah. Train for use of force. We do that. Have de escalation. Like, yo, everything you're complaining about, we've had on the books for years. Yeah. Like, why, why am I going to go to Manassas, Virginia for something that happened somewhere else? Like, right? Like, we don't, it's, it's like me arresting somebody in California because something that happened in Texas. It's not logical. And in Jersey, I think our attorney general at the time just missed the opportunity to say, listen, we understand that this is horrible and tragic, and we do not support any of the stuff that happened in Minnesota. But we've always done, we've already done things like de-escalation. We've already mandated that the only time you can use a, a chokehold is in a deadly use of force situation. Like that should have been said with the caveat of, but yeah, we're definitely open for discussion to reword some of the things yeah. that we have and better train our officers. But how are you going to get better training if you don't fund the police and fund the training and then also get the manpower up? And how are you going to recruit people if you can't retain people? We can't recruit. You can't recruit. It's hard right now. This is like the least desirable job because do you want to? I mean, I look at people that get hired today and I'm like, God bless you. Amen. Yeah. Because you Hell call, yeah. Yeah. Because the camera and these fucking phones have made it that a mistake or a human error now never ends. It's, it's you get crucified for it or for something you didn't said a while ago, right? Or who you were at 22 and an idea you had at 22 is now held against you at 45. It's like, you all motherfuckers like to travel in time and judge, don't you? Yeah. Let me into your closet. But we allow it, right? We, we do. allow it. If I can release a body camera because they might burn my city down, then I can release a body camera to say, that's not what happened. And if more agencies actively, actively try to dispel false narratives, then eventually I believe the media will have nothing to go on. Th th it's just not there. Yeah. And it's not being defensive, but why should I be defensive? If you accuse me of murdering somebody. I'm going to be defensive. Like, stop it. Like, so it's, I don't see it as a negative reaction. I don't see it as being just sensitive or defensive. Like, no, I owe it to my agency. I owe it to my officers to stand up and say, that's not what happened. And you, whatever Fox, whatever news you are, or you, MSM, whatever you are, you're lying. It's a blatant lie. You're taking one version of a truth. You're running with it. And you're not interviewing us. That's not journalism, right? That's sensationalism. And you're creating a dangerous environment for us. Look at our ambush numbers. Heather, look at our fucking ambush numbers. I know. Look at the numbers of officers shot. You know, as I, as I travel, one of the things I do at the end is, depending on what state I'm in, I pull out the Officer Down Memorial page and I talk about all the officers killed in line of duty in that state and every single one gunfire and how officers are gunfire is number one. And like astronomically. So you'll see hundreds of officers in a specific state killed by gunfire and then 57 in a motor vehicle crash or, you know, some in accidental gunfire. Right. But yeah, I mean, and why aren't we training like that? I just saw a video from June. I didn't catch what agency it was, but the officer was sitting in his cruiser extra patrol at the quality Inn. And he's just sitting there and a guy comes on camera. It was a surveillance camera that captured it. And he walks across, he looks at the cop car, walks inside to like an ATM or inside the hotel, comes out and then just opens fire on that cruiser. And that cop, man, he had the mentality to dump out, go low, drew his weapon, returned fire, circled around his vehicle, engaged the suspect, engaged the suspect, eventually got on and was like, hey, I'm hit, shots fired. I'm still standing, right? And it felt like for ever before backup got there but if you don't train for that scenario like can i tourniquet myself do i know cover concealment can i return fire can i force myself as much as i can to stay in the fight and stay awake then you get caught off guard yeah and i don't want to give it to anybody i, I, don't, I don't want a hero's funeral fuck that no right way. i don't want that shit but it's gotten to the point that just doing an extra patrol is sitting in your car what, what was the big thing 20 years ago 10 years ago five years ago i want you in your cruisers doing your paperwork I want the public to see you now I'm like, no, I want to find a building behind where I can see every entrance and exit because the number of officers shot in their cruisers in the last, what, since 2014, 2013? A hell of a lot than ever before that. Yeah, because we're easy to find. Yeah. Got that big old banner that's right across. Philadelphia, of California, the two that were shot there. I mean, having dinner. Maryland had a, what, I think it was two or three having dinner, got gunned down. Recently, Pennsylvania, right outside yes. the, the headquarters. Yes. Yeah. And then people wonder why, you know, cops are... Because you don't, you don't train for the everyday, right? You train for that what-if moment. Because mm -hmm. the what-if moment is the most expensive one. It's the attack you don't see coming. It's the ambush. It's the one that wants to engage you. So I always tell officers, look super approachable. Like, I'm talking to you. I'm fine. I'm cognizant of my weapon side. And in my mind, I'm like, if this bitch dives at me, I'm going to do this. 
So I have a plan close to my head. Yeah. If it goes well, cool. If it didn't, you'll never know because I'm not looking at you like I'm going to, right? I'm relaxed. But in my head, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. That's an exhausting way to live. But what is the opposite of not doing that? It's an expensive funeral. Kids are devastated, right? You become a stat. You have an engraving in a wall that I don't want to see filled with names. But it's like, if you don't say it to the public and explain it to them, and it's like, listen, this is a very, this is, this is my life. This isn't a joke to me. And then put the blame on me somehow. We don't hold anybody accountable anymore. It's like, it's all our fault. Yeah. I didn't make you point a gun at a cop. I didn't make you resist arrest. I, I did not, I was not responsible for the trajectory of your life. I'm going to intervene because we have social contracts because the side has said, this is not okay. And then now you didn't want to go to jail or you'd rather die than go. And then the outcome should be, feel bad for the family. But this is what they did. It's not my fault. And we become apologetic. Yeah. It's sad. It breaks my heart for our, our industry. It breaks my heart for, it's not industry. We do this because we give a shit about people. Yeah, at the heart of everything. Yes. I, I think all of us have a story. Like if I ask every person who became a cop, why'd you become a cop? You get the standard, well, yeah, I want, no, no, no. Why did you do it? Well, when I was seven, I got bullied. Or my mom was killed by her husband, right? Or my friend was killed by a DUI. Everybody has a story. Even if it's just, I, want to, I really want to help people. Like, do you think I chose this profession to make money? Because <laughs> it isn't this one. Nope. Right? I didn't wake up and go, I want to be a police officer so I can get criti you know, criticized, get admonished by my own agency, get shit on by a seven-year-old, get spit on by people, be told that I suck, uh, they hate me, and I'm going to make zero money. No. It's service. It's the greatest calling there is. I agree. But we have to also educate our brethren and educate those, you know? That's how we change. And then you have classes like yours. Be the change. Why do we start this job, right? Or leadership, right? At least help agencies identify leaders versus managers. It's all important shit. One day at a time, which is why you have street cop. Different, outside the box thinking. Subject matter experts are all long-term cops, right? Real training for real cops. Who give a shit. Yeah, and don't pull a curtain across to make it look nice and nope. pretty. Nope. It's down, it's dirty, it's real. It's, it's why I love it. It's why I love that you're a part of this team because you're just, I love being you a part fit of it. so perfectly in here. I love it, my girl. Well, all right, listen, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I really want you all to just get on the website and check out Ellie. I mean, first of all, it's great to not just be the only chick cop on Street Cops. Like, it, was, it, was, it was nice for a little while, but I'm well, thank so you for glad sharing that you're here. Stage, though. Oh, I will I will reach down and pull everybody up that I can who's worthy of being there because it's important to right like that's what our real role is as a leader is to make room for people to be better than us yeah and to come up and do better and so, keep it going yeah so check out Ellie and her class give the name again legal use of force for the law enforcement professional I love that you use the word professional after law enforcement too it's not just like law enforcement officer because again this is a profession and we're trying to be more professional yeah and you really do such a great job. The class is just, I mean, I can sit there the whole entire time and I learned so much. Every time I talk to you, I learn something. So Ditto. I hope I love you. Ditto, love you too. Dale. Dale. All Mr. right. 305, call us. Please do. Street See cop ya. out. Hey guys, follow us on all social media platforms to include Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook group. We have so much information going out every single day and we don't want you to miss out on any of that stuff. So check it out. Go give us a follow.